According to the National Institute of Mental Health, 6.5% of Americans suffer from aviophobia, an irrational and extreme fear of flying. Do you think if I were to go up to one of these people and say, did you know, statistically speaking, that it's safer to fly than it is to drive, that that would cure them of their fear of flying? Of course it wouldn't. You know that as well as I do, because fears are oftentimes irrational. Our fears don't care if the math checks out. And it's because of that we tend to give fear a really bad rap. We say things like fear is bad for us. We say that fear makes us weak and that those who are fearless are strong and are leaders. And these assumptions, well, they couldn't be further from the truth. Fear is extremely useful. You just have to know how to use it. There's a group of people who agree with me a group of people whose daily lives are impacted by their ability to feel fear. People who would not be here today if they weren't able to be afraid. And those people are all of us. They're our ancestors, the first Homo sapiens to walk this earth several hundred thousand years ago. They looked like you and me. They walked like you and me. They used tools. Their brains were very similar to ours as well. And fear to them was a survival instinct that kept them alive. If we think back to several hundred thousand years ago when the first Homo sapiens were walking Earth, you can imagine fears like animals that are big predators, saber toothed tigers, for example. If you see them, your fear will kick in and that will tell you to either run or fight, fight or flight. If you're riding in your caravan and some bandits appear, well, fear would tell you that you should probably fight back, otherwise you and your friends and family could be killed. Today we have the same exact fear system as them, the same brain. It's just that the fears have changed. Nowadays we're afraid of different things, things like ending a toxic relationship, asking your boss for a raise, or public speaking. In these situations, we can't really use the same strategies as they did several hundred thousand years ago. If you're sitting with your boss and you're about to ask for a raise and you get afraid, well, you can't run away. That would look pretty bad. And you certainly can't pull out your pocket knife. That's, that's assault and you will go to prison. So fight or flight are both kind of taken off the table for almost everything we do. We need to reprogram our brains to interpret fear in a different way, a way that benefits us for our modern fears, not for fears that are outdated and, well, behind us. There's a lucky way we can do this. I say lucky. It's not really luck. It's just the way our brain works. There's another emotion inside of our body that happens to be almost identical to fear. And you can replace your fear with this emotion, and it will allow you to tackle your fears with more enjoyment. What are the characteristics of fear? Well, you have an elevated heart rate, you're very focused, and you have a feeling in your gut of anticipation. Now, what are the characteristics of this other emotion that you have? The emotion of excitement. You have a feeling in your gut of anticipation. You're very focused and your heart rate is elevated. These emotions are almost identical to one another. They're actually processed in the same portion of our brain, the amygdala, and they release a very similar chemical response to one another in our bodies, almost identical. So if we can replace our fear with excitement, we can then tackle our fears in a much more easy to manage way. Now, the person I learned this from is Simon Sinek, who is a famous speaker and author. And what he does is he just tells himself he's excited when he's actually afraid. And that works for him and it makes him feel better. If you're like me and you're an anxious wreck and you overthink everything, that won't work. You need a little bit more convincing to really convert your fear to 
excitement, which is why I have three ways to effectively do that. The first method is to prepare for the worst. When you're afraid of doing something, it's usually because you've weighed the pros and the cons, and the cons are terrifying. Let's say you're trying to leave a toxic relationship. Well, the cons would be, what if you never meet someone new? What if it was wrong to leave the relationship? What if I'm just lonely forever? These are common cons. These cons can be terrifying, and no matter how good the pros are, and no matter how bad the relationship might be, it can feel impossible to escape because the cons are just scary. So here's what you do. You should prepare for the worst case scenario in anything, not just, you know, leaving a bad relationship. Set up a plan for what you will do if worst case scenario happens. If you're looking for a new job and you're afraid the new job will suck, we'll have a backup plan. Have other jobs on standby. Have an easy way maybe to go back to your current job. Not always possible, but maybe it is. Having a preparation for the worst can make it easier to see the good things in something you're trying to do. Make it easier to focus on the excitement rather than the things you're afraid of. The next method is weighing the cost of inaction. Once again, when you're trying to decide whether or not to do something, we tend to look at the pros and cons of doing it. You know, if I were to leave my job and go somewhere else, these are the things that could go right, and these are the things that could go wrong. But we tend to miss the other half of the picture, which is, what if I don't make this decision? What are the pros and cons of keeping my current job, staying put, and not going anywhere? If you weigh the pros and cons of doing, and the pros and cons of not doing, it gives you a much fuller picture. And it helps you realize that time is also an element in all of this. I said we're going to weigh the cost of inaction. When you're not doing anything, you're just using time. Opportunities might be passing you up. Things could be changing, and you could be not changing with them. Looking at both sides of the coin, realizing that time isn't really your friend in this scenario, can help you face fear with fear. You know, fear of inaction can force you into action and make you face your other fears. The last method is to realize the opportunity of failure. I like to say that failures are mistakes you refuse to learn from. Everybody makes mistakes, every single person. If you say you've never made a mistake, you're a liar, and I don't believe you. Mistakes are fine, though, because a mistake usually involves learning. You tend to not make that mistake again, or at least not many more times again. A failure, though, a failure is different. A failure is when you made a mistake and you refused to take anything from it. You said, nope, this wasn't my fault, or nope, there's nothing for me here, and I don't care. Don't be that way. If you're trying to decide whether or not you should do something, if you're afraid of doing it, realize this. If you do it, and you realize later that it was the wrong decision, you are better equipped to make that decision in the future for the rest of your life. You will probably never make that mistake again. And that's a great tool to have in your arsenal, because it's very rare that we make a decision, and it's the only time we make that decision. There will be many times in your life you probably face a decision similar to the one you're facing now, the thing that you're afraid of. So realize that taking action and moving forward can help prepare you for that decision in the future. If you do these three things, you prepare for the worst, which basically means have a backup plan. If you weigh the cost of inaction and you realize that sitting here trying to make a decision, sitting being paralyzed by fear is costing you, and you realize that there is opportunity, things to be gained from making a mistake, you'll be better off. You'll be more able to convert your fear to excitement. And when that's possible, what can't you accomplish? Hopefully this helps you. I hope it does. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them down below. This is a sort of example TED talk I plan on doing. TEDx talk, I, I mean. This is a loose representation of a talk I want to give that I've been working on actually for several months now. So if you have feedback, if you disagree with me on anything, I want to hear it. Tell me. G give it to me. Tell me I'm wrong. And uh, if there's things you liked, I would also love to hear that. Obviously, if I do this in speech form, I'm going to change a lot of things. The timing will be different. I will 
uh, some things will be different, but the overall theme will likely remain the same. So tell me what you think. Hopefully this is useful to you. And uh, go out there and be the best you can be.